Hey everyone, welcome back to My Movie Story. It's Brian here and this is the podcast where we chat to everyday people about three special films, uh, their all-time favourite, the film that changed their life or their perspective on life and the film they want you to see. It's one of those must-see movies. So uh, if you've been watching the show so far, you'll see every episode is a little bit different, um, although we have had the Goonies twice, but I've been told I'm not allowed to do that anymore, so <laughs> we'll, we'll hold off on the Goonies for a while, but everyone has different films and different stories behind their film. So, uh, and yeah, I guess tonight, Sarah, I'm sure will be no different. So this is Sarah Lippman. She's originally from the seaside town of Essex in the UK, which is just east of London. Uh, she's been living in Australia for about 15 years though, and she's studied film and television production uh, with a focus on documentary filmmaking. Um, she actually did a documentary about the Jedi church. Uh, about two brothers who launched that in Wales, which would be really interesting to hear about. And she currently works as a streaming media producer for a global communications company um, with a focus on webcasting uh, for investor rela relations and digital events and that kind of thing. And she also loves editing and is currently completing a pro course in editing. Um, in her spare time, outside of all of that, <laughs> she loves to be outdoors and loves paddleboarding and is learning how to surf and race and um there's lots going on there so yes welcome sarah great to uh chat to you welcome to my movie story thank you brian i'm excited to be here <laughs> excellent me too me too um yeah we were just talking before this episode about it, when we last caught up and there's been a few times and you know obviously you and i know each other through through camp america and stuff and and through nicole um so yeah tell us a little bit more about yourself sarah what's what's happening in your world in my world, yeah. Well, I mean, that's, you know, um, a good segue to, to how we met. So a big moment in my life was working with Camp America back in uh, 2007. Um, so my, as you mentioned, I'm from um, a seaside town in the UK. And um, probably like a lot of British families, I would go to the same place every year for my summer holidays. Yeah. Um, it was an hour down the road. Um, but then um, the place that we were going on holidays, um, the woman retired. So I suddenly had this summer free and I thought, well, what am I going to do with this summer? Oh, and wow. I heard of this thing called Camp America. Um, so it was a very spur of the moment decision. I went down to London and um, got hired um, at this place called Camp Crosley uh, that was in mm. Indiana. And I ended up, I think it was only about two months after that um, at the camp doing video and media management and yeah. um, taking on all the responsibilities of that. Uh, but I had the summer of my life. It was the most yeah. incredible thing and Absolutely. met some amazing people, uh, including your wife, Nicole, and, <laughs> and, and subsequently you. Um, you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was, uh, that was, that was an incredible life changing, life changing oh, summer. Mm. It totally is. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I shared a little bit of my Camp America story in our, second episode with Emily because Emily and I worked together on my camp and we ran video production as well um so how, how many years did you do Crosley for uh, only one year and yep. I really wanted to go back but I think by the next summer I was in Australia so mm. it was a bit further to travel yeah and, of uh, course yeah and then in 2010 we were, we were all there for Grant and Corey's wedding Yes, we, yeah. Were. Yes. we were. That's um, that's when yeah. I met you for the first time, and I I came work with Nicole on Crosley, having worked on my camp, and yeah, and um, yeah, awesome camp. And shout out to all the Crosley people watching. How you guys go, and hope you're enjoying it. If you want to be a guest, let me know. <laughs> It'd be great to have. <laughs> we you. love you all. <laughs> yeah, good. miss you guys. Miss you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And um, so like you said, you've been living in Australia and uh, for about fifteen years. And have you been back to England many times since then? Have you had the chance to go back home? Every year, oh, <laughs> I've amazing. managed to go back every year, if not once and twice. And yeah. I don't know how I manage it. Um, but <laughs> yeah, so just because because my family are there, you know, so yeah. so I've always tried to go back. Uh, until recently, it's been at Christmas because I still can't grasp the concept of a hot Christmas. So you know, but it's right. always a cold Christmas for me. But yeah. um, but I've recently switched that now. So I go back in the summers, which is good because now I've started paddleboarding. It's a lot more, <laughs> a lot more enjoyable in the summer. Of course. <laughs> to do that. <laughs> yeah. 
to do it over there, it would just be ice, wouldn't it? So it'd be like you'd be skidding across <laughs> the ice on your belly or something. <laughs> it's, it's just like ice skating. <laughs> pretty much, pretty, pretty, but on a paddle board, yeah. I don't, yeah. Could be a new sport. I don't know. We'll, we'll see how we go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we could have just invented something. <laughs> we could have, yeah. This is, you know, this is where you heard it first here on the on the podcast. Absolutely. <laughs> and um, the tell us about this Jedi Church documentary you did because I I found out after watching Star Wars years later that. Jedi is actually now classed as a religion and that there's people all over the world who like are full on Jedi worshippers. Yeah. yeah. So ha- tell yeah. us about it. How'd that happen? So I was studying film and television production at uni and for the third year project, um, I was trying to think of what to make my film about. And I realized that, um, yep, yeah, Jedi was classed as a religion because I think they had over a certain amount of people on the 2001 census say that they were Jedi. So, <laughs> A couple of brothers in Wales, um, in North Northern Wales, had um, actually set up a church of yeah. the Jedi. So I got in touch with them and said, "Can we come and film you? You know, can we can we yeah. see what you're about?" And they were just the loveliest guys, and they were like, "Come over." You know, so they welcomed us in, and we sat in on their meetings uh, where they would talk about Yoda's teachings and then they do lightsaber <laughs> battles and training. And um, I remember interviewing their mum, and she was like what have I given birth to? <laughs> I don't understand <laughs> yeah, yeah. how this has happened. Yeah. Uh, but it was a really good film. And um, I think when, just before graduation, we filmed it, at, at, we showed it a film showing in Soho in London. And um, yeah, it went down pretty well. It was, um, well yeah. Yeah, it was a good, good, good film to make. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And one of the perks of being like a documentary filmmaker is, you know, it's, it's looking at real life and real people and, um, you know that's that's really interesting. So it would take you to some interesting places, wouldn't it? And meet oh, some it interesting would, people. Yes, and yeah. you know I've always thought that Louis Theroux has the best job in the world. Oh, you know? yeah. Like, Tell me about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Just putting himself in the most random places with people that most of us would never meet. And he, yeah. he's so cool and natural, you know. And he just mm-hmm. he gets stuff out of people even if they don't want to tell him. And it's like I nothing know. phases him. Yeah, he's he's a pretty yeah. smart guy. Yeah, he's a bit like Colombo, sort of. You know, you underestimate him, and yeah, then, yeah, and then he just, it. you know, yeah, makes people open up. Yeah, for brilliant. sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, his documentaries are great. Yeah, so yeah. fantastic. Yeah, well, um, you know, lots of uh, there's lots of uh different um Star Wars related stuff out there, like the Jedi Church. And now you've got all these TV shows, and we've had a couple of the movies featured on our podcast as well. So. You know, Star Wars is, is it's everywhere, you know, whether people are fans or not, you, you can't escape it. But um yeah, I think that's <laughs> it's amazing how far its reach has gone and you know, it's just uh you couldn't imagine life without it really. Um but yeah, it's it's really cool. All right, well let's let's talk about you and your movies now, Sarah. So um uh I know with your interest in media and film production and stuff, you would have a, a pretty good take, I think, on films and thinking about how they're made and kind of what goes on behind the scenes and stuff. And I think the three films you've chosen are are, are really interesting and they're all really different. Uh, a couple of old classics and one that is considered a comedy classic. <laughs> That's not really old. We'll get to that in a minute. So um, the first one though is like, I want to um, hear about your film, which you considered was like uh, life changing or changed your perspective on film and what movies could be and um, all of that. So yeah, can you introduce that fi- first film for us? Yes, so that film for me um, is called 12 Angry Men. Here's what I think happened. How can I be positive about anything? I don't understand you people. I mean, all these picky little points you keep bringing up, they don't mean nothing. You are going to try a man for murder. The awesome power to kill will suddenly be thrust into your hands. Watch them and pray, for someday you may become one of them. Twelve men. Angry men, yeah. So anyone who's not familiar with that, the, the basics are it's a old film from the 1950s i think it was yeah 1957 yeah there you go it's black and white so you know that not everyone's cup of tea but if you can get past the black and white you can discover some really great films and and this is one of them yeah so um Mm -hmm. give us the the quick rundown of 12 angry men i mean the title kind of says it all really 
12 angry men <laughs> but why are they <laughs> angry where are they what's going on <laughs> okay so so you could say it's a courtroom drama except that you're only in the courtroom for maybe the first 30 seconds to a minute of the film mm. uh, the rest of it takes place uh, in the uh, jury, uh, the jurors are deliberating a court, um, a court case that they've just that they've just seen. So obviously there's twelve of them. Um, they're fairly angry, and they're all basically <laughs> try, trying to decide um, whether the boy on trial is guilty of murdering his father or not. So mm. the film follows these jurors as they are deliberating and as the their characters. <laughs> <laughs> are sort of pitted against each other and that's where a lot of the conflict comes from in the film but it's it's absolutely yeah. gripping it, it really is yeah and um, I've only seen it once it was way back in uh, TAFE when I was studying youth work we watched it when we were doing the whole unit about um, legal and ethical stuff because when you're training to be a youth worker you you get told that you might actually have to um, go and support a client who's in court and uh, you know we work with clients and young people who might offend and we have to still support them and put away our personal bias aside, um, which which is a difficult thing to do. But you just learn it as you go as a youth worker. So that's how I was introduced to it. How were you introduced to this film? How did you discover it? Uh, through my dad. So my yeah. dad's got excellent taste in TV and films. He he really loves, um, he's got a broad um, love of TV and film yeah. and his dad in sort of um, gave that to, to my dad so yeah. they would watch films together and then dad would show me films so I think I was maybe about 14 when I saw this film for the first oh, time really young, yeah. Um, yeah so one of our favorite things to do I mean there's not a lot else to do in England when you're you know the weather's so bad <laughs> to sit and watch <laughs> and watch tv but um yeah. so we would um yeah so we would watch lots of films and yeah 12 Angry Men was was one of them yeah um yeah would it have been mm. the first black and white film you ever saw do you reckon that's a good question um probably not because a lot of the films that dad loves and showed me were black and white films so I think yeah. mate I don't know um mm. yeah it, what probably one of the first but yeah. I think that's why I don't have an issue with black and white films I'm quite comfortable with them because mm. I, I grew up on them yeah. so I definitely have a love and an yeah. appreciation for for older films as well yeah. as new ones definitely yeah and and like if the story's good and it's really gripping and grossing you, you don't really even think about the fact that it's black and white after a while. You're just like, you're just watching the film and, and later on in, you know, later on in the years, they were able to c colorize these old black and white films. But I, th I think that sort of takes away the the magic of the film when they add color to it. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's cool, but it's not really necessary. I think sometimes black and white is, is better. I think sometimes it just shows just what needs to be shown. Yeah. Um, and if I can slip a reference to another film in here, um, there's another old one called Night of the Hunter, which is just, I, I can't remember who directed it. It stars Robert Mitchum, but yeah. it has stuck in my mind just for the cinematography of it. Yeah. And if it was in colour, I don't think it would be nearly as striking. And mm. so I think it's a shame that a lot of people get put off watching old films because mm. they're black and white and boring. But, you know, it just shows, I think that they had so much more to them because yeah. they couldn't rely on the visuals and you know yeah. the, the color and the, there has to be more to them oh, 100 yeah. percent, yeah and if you think if you really look at it closely i mean those landmark black and white films from the 40s 50s and some in the 60s like we wouldn't have the movies today of today if it wasn't for those films you know what i mean like alfred yeah. hitchcock's psycho was filmed in black and white but that was 1960 like color films were well and truly around it then but he chose black and white because it would be more more uh, striking and it was you know and that's that's like you know one of my favorite all-time movies um yeah. so yeah and i think that was the first black and white film i saw um when i was maybe 17 or something so yeah, yeah. so anyone watching who's like mm, black and white no like get on it like yeah, yeah. <laughs> because You're sometimes life is very black and white so right it's you know it's the perfect <laughs> um color for that kind of film right <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly so, so back to the film so you, you described it really well i think it's essentially it's a film that takes place in one location and mm -hmm. it might have been a play or like a broadway play before it was a film uh, yes, yeah, so I think it started as a television play, and I'm sure yeah. it's been on 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 Broadway as well because it's just mm. made for that. Um, but but 
to me that was one of the standout things the fact that you can watch people talking in a room for a couple of hours and be so immersed in it yeah. because it, it it breaks those fundamental screenplay rules of you know no talking heads you know mm. um no telling us you know no showing us but telling us it's just just it breaks so many fundamental rules. It's yeah. it's so interesting. And I think there's another film called Rope by Alfred Hitchcock, which is another yeah. film that just takes place largely in one room, yeah. which is another excellent film. Yeah. Um, and it's done in real time as well, I think, isn't it? Yeah, yes. I think it is. I think they call it Cinema Nouveau, Cinema Nouveau or something, I where think it's filmed so, in real yeah. time. Yeah. There is one, right. I think, sneaky shot where they sort of go into like a trunk and then pull, pull out. So, and you think, oh, okay, that might have been a cut uh, there. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. but generally, generally, generally it is in real time. So yeah. that was one of the things. So, so yeah, the premise is they are the 12 anonymous jurors. So you never mm. really know their names until towards the end. Yeah. Um, so they're all sitting in one room, just deliberating. You don't know their names. You don't really know, you know, anything else. Yeah. 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 And that, that's the thing. Cause like when you do jury duty, you, you've only met the people that day. And um, yeah. yeah, and so just if we can go to that for a second, have you ever had to do jury duty? No, and I really wish that I had. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I'm kind of the same. Like um, I have done it once and it was, um, if I can just share quickly, it was not long after my mother-in-law, Nicole's mom, um, got roped into jury duty and was sat on a trial that went for eight weeks. So that kind of really, you know, interrupted her life and everything. And she was exhausted by the end of it. And at, by this point, I'd been working in youth work and I'd gone to courts with clients and I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of getting interested in this now. And I'm like, I really want to do jury duty and get in, on this high profile case because around the same time, we had all the Melbourne under, underworld um, killings going on here. So Carl Williams and all that stuff, all those trials were going on at that time at the county court in Melbourne. And I was just kind of crossing my fingers like jury duty, jury duty, jury duty. And then like the letter came and I was like, yes, jury duty. And I went in and I'm like, this is going to be awesome. I can take three weeks off work, get paid and all this stuff. Anyway, we got ushered in and without giving too much away, it was about this man who was there. He had severe mental health issues and he tried to set fire to a tree in a park, like this really tall, really old tree. And uh, the judge was like, well, he's not fit to stand trial because of his mental health issues. Uh, jury, would you please go into the room and deliberate? And we all went in and we were just like, yeah, he, he can't stand trial. And then I said, so I guess we're done. And then everyone like erupted into laughter. And I'm like, Shh, shit, quiet. I don't know if this door soundproof, but the judge and everyone's out there. And we've gone in there and we're just like laughing our heads off. <laughs> and it was all over in three hours. I had to go back to work that afternoon. I'm like, this sucks. Like I was, I wanted this long drawn out case and I got three hours and it just got written off. And and they say they don't call you back for jury duty for like another five years or something. Um, I'm still waiting. Uh, oh, <laughs> so no. that was my experience of jury duty. I'm like, experience. damn it, you know, I wanted like a 12 Angry Men sort of thing going on here. <laughs> yeah, because when you've seen that film, that's and that's kind mm. of your reference point. You think, oh, this is going to be good. You know, I'm going to, sure. I'm going to, yeah. <laughs> a juicy <laughs> no. trial and, yeah. Yeah, no, no. It's not like how it is on TV for everyone. But, um, yeah, no, but um, so, like so just back to the film, you said that, at the very start you see this this kid did he kill his dad yes or no the, the 12 angry men go into this room and they start deliberating and it's all in one room there's a lot of like single takes and all that kind of stuff so from from memory was there a particular scene or moment that from the film that stood out for you that you remember the most well it's a good question because I don't think it's a film that's really made up of scenes. It's more sequences. It's almost just one big scene with a lot of sort of sequences and each sequence has sort of an objective that they're meeting. And so it, the whole film is a standout for me, but mm. um, just to give a bit more context of the film. So Henry Fonda plays jury number, jur juror number eight. Yep. So when they all, um, leave the courtroom and they're sitting in the room um, and they all do the initial vote to see who thinks they're guilty, uh, the guy, the boy is guilty. Um, Henry Fonda is the only one who thinks that he is not guilty. That's right. So, yeah. 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 So, so then that, so then the, the, the rest of the film is about them saying, what, of course he is, you know, and, mm. and, and, and 
And from that point on, you realize that because it is so well written and these characters are so highly developed with so much backstory that informs their decisions and what they saw in the trial, even though they all had the same information given to them, because of all their backstory and their experiences that they've been through, they're seeing completely different things. So it then brings you to this place of like the the conflict is caused by their characters Mm. and their biases. And so for me, probably one of the standout things would be when you've got one of, maybe one juror in particular, I can't remember what number juror he was, but when he, is so convinced and he just says you've convinced me yeah you're not guilty and and it's just like oh um and then there are other standout moments where and i won't give too much away but um there are other standout moments where some of the arguments um that happen to if the audience is so engaged you're being brought along with the argument so you're having to think as well and you're having to think oh yeah what about this oh does that make sense yeah, um yeah, yeah. and so and are my biases coming into play you know yeah. so you're so engaged in it so it's genius, yeah, was, isn't it? yeah. it, it's genius and you feel I like you're in the room with them like you're just you're the 13th jury member who's who can't say anything and you're like oh hang on oh, mm. what's this guy going on about and, and it says a lot about bias and prejudice and and yeah i, I remember just watching it how I, it challenged me and my thinking even like and throughout the film and I, you know i'll definitely go back and watch it again after this episode and rediscover yeah. it but um yeah it's it was so groundbreaking for its time and it's definitely you know had a, a lasting impact on on film and could have been maybe even one of the early films to be based just in one room you know and and focus purely on just one thing that's going on you know but if yeah. it's done if it's done well like it can really engross you it doesn't have to be really plot driven or jumping from one scene to the next it's like it's more like a situation you know and if the situation grabs you then you're in and you can't turn away which is what that film does so well oh yeah exactly and I've always thought um I, I heard this somewhere and I've always thought it's true the best films are where you can summarize the plot in one sentence Mm. And that's what you can do with a film like this. You don't have to have plot twists and, you know, <laughs> different, um, you know, CGI and um, different locations and, and shock scares and all that. You, like, you don't need all that. You just need a simple premise, um, conflict that's driven by characters in a claustrophobic environment, and you've got the recipe for a great film. That's it. That's it, 100%. Yeah, yeah. So... It was, it was, I guess, a masterclass in, you know, a lot of other filmmakers have watched that and been like, ah, oh, that's how you do it, you know? And I think it's been remade a couple of times and there's been plays and versions of it, but that whole concept of like one situation, one character or several, um, like there's another really good film with Tom Hardy called uh, Locke. Have you seen Locke? Heard of it, but I haven't seen yeah. it. But is he driving? It's just him driving in a car for 90 right. minutes and it's like... He's um he's basically fleeing his life and he's on the phone for the majority of the time sorting out work, trying to um, talk to his sons, talk to his wife while he's driving towards this mistake he has to fix up uh, without giving too much away. But it's just him in the car and you're like, well, how can that sustain 90 minutes? But it does, you know, all the different camera angles and and it's just Tom Hardy's just a brilliant actor. And he, yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's another one in the similar vein to this where you're just, mm. you're just drawn in and you're like, yeah, this is all you need. Just a good story and a good situation. Yeah. So, and probably yeah. one of the most stressful films I ever watched was one called Buried, which takes place in a oh, yeah. box underground. <laughs> yeah, Ryan Reynolds. Um, yeah, Ryan Reynolds. Yeah, which was yeah. just I've only been able to watch it once because I yeah. was so, so my yeah so intense. <laughs> absolutely so yeah this this one person or few people in one spot one situation kind of films yeah they're they're challenging to watch sometimes because you're kind of waiting for things to to move and change but then when it's really engrossing and it just draws you in you're like oh i can't look away and and you you tend not to forget those kind of films you know mm-hmm. there's so many films at a disposal disposable yeah. but 12 angry men's just like yeah it's it's a masterpiece so it's a great oh, it really is. oh really good thank film. you yeah yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I highly recommend it. <laughs> For sure. Absolutely. All right, cool. Well, let, let's keep rolling along. And uh, we're now going to change um, categories. We're going to go from uh, 12 Angry Men to Two Stupid Men is <laughs> the best way to describe it. Um, you know, that, that's my best segue that I can think of. 
So if anyone hasn't Very guessed good. what that is yet, um, tell us, Sarah, what is your all-time favourite movie? So my all-time, that was a very good segue. Um, <laughs> so my all-time favourite movie is Dumb and Dumber. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Jim Carrey. Hold that plane! Sir, you, you can't go in there. It's okay! I'm the limo driver! Jeff Daniels. Oh, jeez, look at the butt on that. Yeah. He must work out. Dumb and dumber. <laughs> For these guys, every day is a no-brainer. <laughs> Brilliant. Awesome. Yes, and you know, like when I was thinking, I mean, and it's a very difficult question to answer what your favourite film is because you know, there are so many good films out there and there are so many films that would have made me sound more sophisticated and intelligent and, you know, impressive. And like, I, you know, I could have chosen a really good independent, you know, art yeah. house, you know, indie film. But I thought, you know, you know what? I have to be true to myself. This film, I... It is my favourite film. I <laughs> I have watched it so many times. It never fails to make me laugh. It yep. is so quotable. Every and I just it. love it. I yeah. love it. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's a it's a genuine classic in every way. And it was like came out in nineteen ninety-four and you know, Jim Carrey was just like exploding onto the movie scene and you had Ace Ventura, The Mask, and Dumb and Dumber all in one year. And he just like he killed it and he's like, Yep. I'm Jim Carrey and I'm here to stay. And like, <laughs> it's one of his best films. It's, oh, it's so good. And um, can you remember the first time you watched it? Like, did you get to see it at the movies? Were you old enough? <laughs> no. So, yes, yeah, so I'm trying to think how old I was. So we would go to um, a place called Lee on Sea for breakfast every Saturday morning. And after that, we'd go to Woolworths, which in the UK was different to the Woolworths in Australia. It was sort of right. like a, um, a, I can't even remember what kind of shop it was, but they had toys and, um, you know, pick and mix and stuff there and videos. Okay. So we'd always go there after breakfast. And I remember seeing this VHS um, of Dumb and Dumber on sale. And I thought, oh, well, I've, you know, got to spend my pocket money on something. So I'll treat myself <laughs> to a film. That yeah. looks fun. Uh, so I bought it. I think I was maybe about 14 at the time um, and took it home and just just I didn't know anything about it. So I had no expectations. So my brother, who was four years younger than me, um, and I sat there and watched it. And from the, you know, when you watch something and after about 10 seconds, you think, oh, they, that's yeah. my kind of humor. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I love it. You just this. know straight away. Yeah. yeah. You just know I'm going to love this. We both, we both had that. And I think we were just watching it like that like, the whole time. And, yeah. <laughs> and it just sort of, it just grabbed us from the get go. So yeah, just watched yeah. it at home for the first time. And yep. that was the first of maybe 20, 30 times. I don't know. <laughs> so many yeah. Times. It is so rewatchable, you know, because it's like, it's about these two guys who are just complete nitwits and you know what's going to happen, but it's just like seeing them trying to figure it out and get through it and stuff everything up every single time. <laughs> and it's, it's, there's the scene, it's just one great scene after another. And um, yeah, w would it have been your introduction to Jim Carrey? Was that like your first Jim Carrey film? Yeah, yeah. it was. It was, yeah. yeah, and I love him. I think he's excellent, and he's and great. I love him even in the in his more serious roles, like Eternal Sunshine of a Spotless Mind is oh, another yeah, so good. excellent film. Yeah, uh, he's so diverse. And and speaking of diversity, I mean, that was it was Jeff Daniels' first, yeah. you know, silly uh, role, and I think yep. I think he was very much dissuaded by his agents to do the film. They were like, no, this will kill your career, you know. And I think he was mm. only offered fifty thousand dollars or something whereas jim carrey was offered something like seven million or something yeah. like that but yeah. i think jeff knew like no you know to have a chance to start opposite jim carrey mm -hmm. you know um yeah. and to to show the diversity of his his acting was i yeah. think it was a good choice and i'm so glad he did it because yes. no one casting. else could have yeah. done it mm. yeah absolutely and and if you watch interviews with jim carrey about dumb and dumber he says the film wouldn't have worked without jeff daniels because he gave it credibility. And, mm. and I think the story goes like Jim Carrey and the directors, the Farrelly brothers were on board and working on it and they auditioned a bunch of different people. I think maybe even 
Robin Williams, possibly, they mm-hmm. spoke to and a couple of other actors. Um, and then Jim Carrey met with Jeff Daniels and they started talking and he said they just sort of clicked straight away. And um, and like when you see them on screen together, it's like you f- you it's like they're real friends. You, it's like these guys yeah. have known each other for years and just the yeah. chemistry they had together and how they balanced each other out like mm, how jeff daniel's yes. character was a little bit smarter but still obviously dumb yeah. <laughs> like just the balance there of like who's actually who's dumb and who's dumber like it never yeah. answers who's who but it kind of jumps back and forth doesn't it It does it goes back and forth and you're so right because the chemistry because a lot of that film was improvised and you yeah. know and and so to, for them to be able to pull off some of the best scenes that were improvised just shows how good their chemistry was and how what good actors they are oh, and, and how crazy Jim Carrey is. <laughs> he is. He's just he's nuts. He's nuts. Yeah. And like I, I remember that when he when he came onto the scene and people were just like, Oh my god, that's that's too much, you know. And I was just like, This guy is amazing, he's my new hero. And I, you know, I went and saw all those films at the cinema. And I, re- I remember seeing Dumb and Dumber at the movies. And I think it was, I still remember this as clear as day. I was in grade six. I was like 12, 1994. I went for it with a couple of mates from school. And I'd never been in a cinema where the entire audience was like erupting in laughter. Like everyone was laughing. There was people on the floor. There was, it was just the best experience. And there's, there's so many scenes there where you, you just can't help it. You just burst into laughter it's just yeah just make it's just a it just makes you feel really good and it's yeah. just one of those films that no matter what shit's going on in your life you can watch that and forget yeah. about it and have a great time yeah exactly and at the end of the day isn't that why it's not one of the main reasons why we watch films you know i mean everyone's time is precious so you know if you can spend one or two hours of your time just doing watching something that's going to make you feel good you know we might we probably should all be doing more <laughs> doing more of that because sure. um it, you know it's it, it's it's great being able to watch films and critique them and you know really get something intellectual from them but it's also just as important I think to just watch something just for sheer entertainment value and to yeah. just laugh and Definitely. to share that yeah. experience with others and yeah 100 yeah. percent. and it's a kind of film where you can just if it's on tv you can jump in at any point and you're like oh dumb and dumb is on I'm just going to watch the rest of this now and you know you're yeah. going to have a laugh in like a matter of seconds. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And it helps yeah. you find out who your people are as well. The people that really laugh it and really get those certain jokes. It's like, exactly. oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. And there's there are there there are diehard Jim Carrey haters out there who just can't stand him. And it's like, don't don't watch Dumb and Dumber with them because they'll just sit there and be like this is stupid and it's like exactly that's the point <laughs> it is but stupid. you know a lot of it's clever as well because yeah, i feel yeah. like some of the some of the jokes are very very obvious but some of them are just so subtle and they're some of my favorite ones where you just you you could just miss it you know um not you know i think they're some of my favorite jokes um sure. yeah not not the huge obvious ones yeah, um, yeah. do you have a favorite um, scene from the film i mean it's oh, so many to choose from but like what, what are the standout is- ones that is such a difficult question. <laughs> I, I love, I love it where they're um they're lying on the hotel bed, like crying yeah. into their money and blowing their nose <laughs> into their dollars. At this really yeah. sad film that's on the TV, but it turns out it's just an advert. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and um, so just some of the some of the really subtle things that that they say, like when they find. So the premise of the film is they find this um suitcase full of money, and they're like, we've got to return it to the. To, the, to its rightful owner, who was a woman that um, Jim Carrey met and all fell in love with. But it's actually ransom that she's left because her husband has been kidnapped. So they've stuffed up the whole ransom idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he comes back home with this suitcase and he says to Harry, like, what, what's in it? <laughs> you know, Harry's like, you, you can't open a, you can't open the suitcase. Is it, is it locked? And oh, no, I've, I've stuffed up the quote, but basically it's just like, you know, uh, oh, I can't even remember it. Can you remember the quote? <laughs> Uh, not specifically it's um oh no like... no yeah sorry he brings back the suitcase and jeff daniels who's harry is like well have you checked inside it and he's like jim carrey's like man i have to be some kind of a low life to go rooting around in someone else's private property and, yeah, and harry's right. like is it locked <laughs> and jim carrey's like yeah really well <laughs> yeah that's just like, it yeah just those tiny little things that's um it. they're so stupid I, think, yeah. <laughs> I know and obviously the last the very last scene is um is is quite iconic as well for sure yeah I, th- I i think for me my favorite scene is when um lloyd has the dream like he's he's driving and harry's asleep and he's like 
mm-hmm. like that while he's driving and he starts dreaming about Mary and it's um like it opens up with him telling some joke and it's like we haven't caught the start of the joke but he's like uh he says something like uh do you love me no but that's a great ski mask and then they all break up into laughter and i'm like i really want to know the start of that joke like with that punchline how can that be so funny i mean obviously they probably didn't write the joke but you know just just how he how animated he is and like he's in the kitchen in the restaurant beating up all the waiters and stuff it's just so good it's like yeah yeah, it is so good and the the pacing is so good i just i it's just so clever that they've made a film that makes you laugh like on like every minute basically yeah, pretty you much know? it's How non-stop yeah, yeah it's non-stop even just like even when they're not talking and they're just like his hair you know the missing tooth just like yeah. the car that just the way they look and dress like you just you're just smiling and, and laughing the whole way through you know yeah. <laughs> even but if it's I, not I, out I, loud yeah but there's another dimension to it because you do feel for them as well you know they're mm-hmm. likable guys and they've they you know they're 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 decent guys they're just really dumb <laughs> <laughs> they are they really are and you think well maybe by the end they'll finally figure it out and then like that bus of all the women in their bikinis and they're like you're in luck there's a town about 10 miles away and, like, and then it's oh, like okay. do you realize what you've done yep. runs yep. off the bus yep. the town <laughs> is that to way excuse my friend yeah <laughs> town's back that way so yeah. so many good scenes so many good scenes yeah so, um, so i mean obviously without drawing attention away from this film too much um did you see the the prequel and the sequel like when they were younger and then the sequel like 20 years younger have you seen them yeah so i didn't see the prequel because i yep. don't think it had anything to do with anyone from the original film so i no. kind of stayed away from it on principle because i yeah. just thought no I'm not gonna yeah i haven't seen it either i've heard it's pretty average yeah but yeah. yeah um my brother and i went to the cinema to see the sequel and we enjoyed it mm-hmm. um we thought it was it it was done well um, we laughed. Uh, we thought like the 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 joke, the sort of reveal was was brilliant. But I think as time went on and we looked back on reflection, we realised like it it was never going to have the cultural impact that the first one had. Yeah. And the, the my brother just we were talking about this while I was at home. He said I can't remember what he said. It they they did. Nah, I'll have to. I'll get back to you. My brother had cool. a really good insight about the difference between the um, the, the sequel. Yeah. Um, it was just maybe a bit too obvious. Yeah. The, the 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 jokes. I don't know. It, yeah. It just wasn't quite the same. No, definitely not. No, it it had it had some funny scenes. Like I agree with you. I think the the plot was quite clever about him trying to track down his daughter and all this stuff. And and they were obviously just as stupid if not stupider than before and <laughs> um yeah. little references to the first film but yeah the first film is just like it's one of the best comedies ever you know like yeah. even though it is ridiculously stupid and it's about two dumb guys it's like it's it's done in such a clever way that you like you it's hard not to like it you know even if you're not a huge jim carrey fan like that's you can watch that and it's yeah it's it's <laughs> it's just a great movie you know and it's it's an yeah. awesome choice and yeah. Um, do you have any other quickly any other Jim Carrey honorable mentions of his? You mentioned Eternal Sunshine, like his serious oh, stuff, yeah. but any of his other films that you like really like? Um, I watched um Yes Man on the plane on the way oh, back yeah. from England. Um, forgot how much I enjoyed that film. Yeah, um, it's not bad. Yeah. Yeah, really good. Um, the the usual ones, that, you know, um, Ace Ventura, um, mm. Lie Liar, um, but you know, I'm not sure if I have seen that many others. Mm. with Jim Carrey to be honest but yeah Eternal Sunshine of a Spotless Mind if, if you've not seen it like yeah. you have to or whoever you know yeah, yeah. it is it's groundbreaking yeah isn't it I mean yeah, like, just... I'm, I'm expecting at some point I'll have a guest who will want to talk about it so mm-hmm. uh, at this point it hasn't been discussed yet so it, it is available <laughs> yeah. anyone who's watching reach out um but yeah I'm, I'm this, I like his comedy I like his his serious stuff and one of his other serious I mean his best serious role I think is the Truman Show like that just oh yeah sent his career in a whole other direction another one that a lot of people remember or talk about is one called The Majestic oh Um, not not seen that yeah so that came out in around 2001 and it kind of flopped a bit because it came out right around the time of 9-11 so the world had sort of shut down and no one was really going to see the movie so it kind of got forgotten but it's set in the 1950s and he's like a, a screenwriter in Hollywood and he um he falls out of his car, gets amnesia and finds himself in this town. And this whole town believe he's this 
guy who went to war who they thought was dead but has come back to life and stuff but then you find out his his past comes back to get him and stuff so it's a it's a mm-hmm. kind of a slow film but it's like a tribute to the old classic films of the 40s and 50s and it's similar mm-hmm. in style to the film we're about to talk about <laughs> where he kind of really channels that that kind of actor and that style so yeah i, I like that one because it's a it's a love letter to movies as well because the majestic is the name of the, the cinema in the town that they reopen once he comes right. back and it's like you know, and they, it's a, a celebration of movies and stuff. So yeah, that's a good one. The Majestic as that well. That sounds good. Thank you. I will, I will, um, I will watch that. You've just reminded me there's another, one of my favourite films, if I'm allowed to slip another one in, is called sure. Random Harvest. And that's yeah. an old, old black and white film about a man yeah. who has amnesia. Okay. Um, and, and I won't say any more than that, but it's the most atmospheric, moving, it, it's another incredible film. So awesome. yeah. We'll yeah, definitely. Well, we'll pop the title up here on the screen and, for anyone who wants to check out Sarah's honorable mentions, definitely <laughs> she knows her movies, so definitely check them out. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Well, Dumb and Dumber, um, you know, great film. Um, we could talk about it forever, but we do have one more film we've got to get through, and we're going to go back in time again. And this is um, a pretty special film, uh, and it's the film that you think everyone needs to see. And um, I just watched it for this interview and i couldn't agree more i'm going to let you just introduce it tell us about it (laughs) so it's called it's a wonderful life this is what i wished for you see george you really had a wonderful life beautiful yep yep a wonderful life and instantly you hear the title of that film and you're just like oh you know that's going to be a feel-good movie Mm -hmm. (laughs) and it and it does make you feel incredibly good watching it and and it you know it's uh has some some serious dark moments in it as well but yeah like tell us about it like you know most people probably heard of this film because it's like I think it's like on the list of 100 films you need to watch and it's considered like one of the best films ever made and yeah so um what's your what's your summary of it's a wonderful life what can you tell us about it so it's um I think it was made in 19 uh, yeah I wrote that down 1946 it was made in and it's about a man called George Bailey who was played by the wonderful James Stewart who was also in Hitchcock's Rear Window and oh yeah that's right. amazing other films yeah one of my favorite actors and so he plays this man who um uh, lives in this town called Bedford Hills or Bedford yeah uh, Bedford Hills I think uh, small town America um, and it and the film opens and it's Christmas Eve um, and he's he's contemplating killing himself because he has just had enough and mm. <clears throat> he has he, he's basically lived his whole life in this town but he's had really big dreams and he he's dreamt of traveling and you know seeing the world and doing big things but at every step of the way he's found himself trapped in his town because he's such a good man Mm -hmm. and because he is selfless and he's he sees people that need his help because he um he owns um uh building and loan I think the company is so he helps he helps people in need who need houses and so throughout the course of his life he's sort of found himself trapped um even though he's never let go of his dreams. And then some 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 really bad things happen to him and he's facing some pretty dire situations. And so the film opens and he's contemplating, you know, and he's sort of praying and he's like, if you can hear me, you know, help me. And so in sort of, it's quite kind of quaint, you know, the way they did it, but you've got the, I don't know, celestial beings talking to each other saying, yeah. George needs a bit of help down there. Let's who can we send? Let's let's send yeah. Clarence. He's a, he's our second class angel. He's he's got some spare time. He needs yeah. to earn his wings. We will send him down. So they send, <laughs> <laughs> so they send this angel down, and so 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 it's a it's basically a film where George is shown what the world would have been like without him if he had mm. never existed. Yep. So it's a film that explores the idea of personal value and you know the fact that we do not operate in a vacuum Mm -hmm. and that regardless of how 
how you perceive yourself or your self-worth or um you know how you've lived your life you know we 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 are always affecting people yeah um yeah and and so it's it's a feel-good film but it really tugs on those heartstrings as well oh, i mean absolutely yeah yeah for sure um, and, and we'll, we'll 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 get to that point because i know that's probably gonna a few, a few tears may be shed but um just going back a little bit like um so james stewart one of the most like loved actors of all time and he was kind of like the the first every man of of cinema it's like he could play any part everybody liked him it's like it's impossible not to like this guy you know he's he's charming he's good looking he's personable he's he's just sort of a really effortless actor and you just you're drawn into him straight away so perfect perfect actor for this film i thought and um I'd seen a couple of his other films before this, and I think I'd seen Rear Window and Vertigo, those Hitchcock films he'd done and all that. Um, but yeah, this was him, like you know, pretty early on in his career. I think he was just getting yeah. started, and and um, and yeah, like you said, he's this man who's in a he's in a small town and he wants to break free, but all these things happen that compel him to stay. And like you said, he stays because he's such a good man and he doesn't want to let people down. And I think it says a lot about you know when we put others before ourself yeah that's that's good and it's fulfilling and rewarding but then if our focus is completely on other people all the time we forget to look after ourselves and then we can miss stuff and i think that's where he puts probably too much faith in certain people who make mistakes and then he has to pay the price for it um yeah did, did you sort of pick up on that as well in the film like he's he's kind of really altruistic and just maybe too selfless Yes, and yeah. it came about in an interesting time period in history as well, because it was post-war, so you had this sort of post-war individualism, this belief in yourself, and you're the master of your own destiny, and you can live your own life, and that was in conflict with the realities of life, which is, well, you have responsibilities and, you know, um, um, people that, that need you, and so I think he embodies that tension really mm. well yep. he's a good man and so he is community focused and that's shown in his line of work you know helping people and sort of protecting them from the greedy board member this guy potter mm. who is just mm. this hard like you know businessman yep. just is all about profits doesn't care if people end up homeless so he is definitely so the source of tension is there because he um he is a good man and as you said he's altruistic but he's also it's almost at the expense of his real dreams which are to mm. to travel and to you know so so the film takes you on this journey about sort of discovery because not a lot of his circumstances change mm -hmm. in the film but it's, yeah. it's his attitude that changes and so yeah. it, you one of the reasons why I feel like everyone should see this film is because it makes you it sort of gives you it gives you a whole new perspective and it sort of makes you makes you reassess you know um what's really important yeah yeah it does and um, yeah sure. it really does yeah absolutely and and when he's you know when he's given that chance to see what happened what his life would have turned out without him and it's dark and it's miserable and it's everyone's just shitty and like everything's falling apart and then he realizes like, wow, like what an impact I've had, what, a, what an impact one person can have. And then when yeah. kind of everything comes back to normal and he runs back to his house and just the way he comes in and hugs his kids and <sighs> hugs his wife, like he'd never seen them before. And it was just like that, that love and, and the performance in that scene was just like one of some of the best acting I've ever seen, I think, because how genuinely he expressed that love. And then, you know, without giving too much away. I mean, we have to talk about the ending. So if anyone hasn't seen this, pause it, go watch the movie <laughs> and then come back. Yeah. But and I, I know you'll have some comments on this as well, but at the end, how then all the people he's helped just flock into his house. And like, I, I've quite often had chats with, cause I'm a coach. I've quite often had chats with clients where I've said to them, think of all the people that you've had an impact on and they, you're on a stage and they're all sitting in the crowd looking at you smiling and they're just clapping saying thank you how would that make you feel and and when i ask clients like that that question because i had that question asked of me many years ago they tear up because it's like oh my god I've, I've there's there are so many people i've impacted and so many people have impacted me we all impact each other and that's kind of what the final moment is i think for him and just the amount of like love and appreciation he gets from people 
like yeah I, I was crying at the end of the film I was just like yeah. like happy crying I was just like, oh my god I did not expect the film to have that kind of impact on me you know yeah and yeah, a lot it's of so people beautiful. come but it is beautiful mm. and like we were saying before a lot of people come at old films thinking well this isn't going to you know this is going to be slow and boring but oh my goodness <laughs> it grabs you much like 12 angry men but it just grabs you and it speaks to your heart and you know like the interesting thing about how that ending it's so happy you know it's in contrast to throughout his life he wasn't really rewarded for all his good deeds you know he was he um suffered for his good deeds you know and it made him resent the town you know when he um so his little brother um he saved his little brother from falling in an ice a lake of ice and because of that yeah, right. accident he lost hearing in his left ear and he stopped the pharmacist because he worked there from accidentally poisoning someone and the pharmacist mm -hmm. slapped him or so, something like that so his good deeds throughout a lot of the film kind of were punished <laughs> they yeah. didn't get rewarded for them but so but the interesting thing is that so that contributed to him feeling this resentment and everything but 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 then as his attitude changed throughout the course of the film and seeing the impact of um of a life without him what that would have been like um it hits him even more at the end yeah you know seeing the townspeople love for him mm -hmm. and you know their gratitude and yeah yeah it's so touching such it's a beautiful so message you know and and if we if we all had that experience where we could just step outside of our life even for just a minute yeah. and like if you were to all of a sudden not exist and then you could see like where your impact w was missed you know we i think we under value ourselves sometimes and under undermine our own impact but if you were to stop and think about it and look at your life and and or even just ask people like how have I impacted your life and see what people say to you you might be surprised what people come back to you with you know and yeah. and I think in my in my own experience where I've, um you know with me and Nicole and and you know what we've been through and, and just seeing all the people that came forward and helped us in really difficult times it was yeah, it was, it was amazing. And it, and it kind of makes all the, the pain and hard work worth it when you get this outpouring of, of love and support all at once. And it's like, if, if that's what your life leads to, then you've lived a good life, you know? And I think that's yeah. what he learns. Hence the name of the movie. It's a wonderful life, you know, because he's had a wonderful life and it's, exactly. it's encapsulated in those final scenes. Yeah. Exactly. And, and it makes you think, well, we should be maybe having conversations like this more, you know, um, because, you know, to, to be able to even tell other people the impact that they've had on us, you yeah. know, and, and, and to make sure that people know how much we love them and, and mm. you know, how, how, um, how important everyone is, you know, and so it really reframes things, it really gives you another just a different sense of perspective and yeah. and a sense of gratitude as well mm -hmm. that you know maybe you've helped people and that there are definitely people that have helped you and that you know we're mm -hmm. we're we are dependent on yeah. on those relationships in our lives sure. yeah. yeah yeah and it teaches us to appreciate what we have instead of you know longing after this thing that we haven't got and to always be chasing something you know and i think uh it just goes to show that we, we might all have dreams and like things we're aspiring to, but you know, life has other plans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> life says, no, screw you. I'm going to do this instead to you. And it's like, you've, you've got to just make the best of it somehow, you know? And I think that's what he does. Like he has these moments in the film where he, he loses his cool and he, he snaps and he's like, Oh, come on, don't do this. You're such a nice guy. And then it's like, you know, everyone has their breaking point, obviously. Yeah. But then, you know, when he realizes, Hey, I'm actually going to, lose the things that are most important like and he's like right now i understand what life's all about and it's like i've yeah. never seen that message in a film done so what so well you know so beautifully yeah. like in that movie and it's yeah, i feel like it world. it does and i mm -hmm. feel like it's even more relevant today mm -hmm. because in a world where we're constantly being bombarded with people's perfect lives and comparing ourselves to to them and feeling like we need to be achieving more and more and more and maybe traveling because everyone on instagram is traveling and you know doing side hustles and making more money and and go 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 um it helps us to remember it, you know it, am i judging myself based on what i'm not doing you know am i mm. am i or or am i judging myself based on who i am and how i'm treating people around me and you know do i have enough am i grateful for what i've already got you know um and so it's just it's it's, it's 
it's about changing your attitude and it's applicable to everyone i think everyone can get something out of this film oh 100 yeah and yeah. and if you look closely there's a couple of little quotes and mottos that come out of the film but obviously the one at the end which is like when he gets the copy of the mark twain book and it's got the message in the end it's like to the richest man in town no one is a, a failure who, who has friends or something like yeah. that and it's like yeah. yeah we are we are the sum of the people in our life and that's true you know, it's not how much money you have, what job you have, you know, uh, what kind of house you have. When, you, when you're when gone, people are not going to be like at your funeral saying, first thing saying, oh, yeah, he had a really nice house and he always kept his garden nice. They're going to be like talking about a memory or an experience they had with you and how you made them feel, you know, yeah. and like that's, that's what it reminds you of. You know, I think that message is so important and I can see why so many people rewatch this film over and over and over again around Christmas time it's one of the like yeah. Christmas favorites and it's yeah, yeah it's now definitely my, one of my Christmas favorites and have oh, you good. seen it several times I'm guessing you've seen it more than once yes I've yeah. seen it several times and one of my favorite times I ever saw it was on a Christmas trip home yep. and and so where I'm from is quite, kind of near London so my dad and I went to London to watch a viewing of it in the tunnels underneath Waterloo station oh cool it was yeah. incredible it was so magical so um they they opened up the tunnels and they had fairy lights everywhere and mulled so wine cool. and you could sort of hear the thunder of the trains over you and it was these beautiful sort of cobbled stones everywhere and mm. Uh, it was the most magical Christmassy uh, experience of viewing that film that I've ever yeah. had. So that, I mean, I'd seen it a few times before then, but it was probably yeah. my favourite time ever watching it. And That's um, cool. And what a special yeah. memory for you to have shared with your dad. And not yeah. just a great film, but what a great way to experience that film. You know, and, and that's that's the other thing about movies is like, it's the, if you can have an experience attached to watching it, other than just watching it on your phone like which is convenient but but going out of your way to go to something like that is just makes it so much more worth it yeah oh yeah oh yeah yeah. definitely yeah Yeah. i always remember that that's beautiful yeah well yeah wonderful life wonderful wonderful movie and yeah that's if you're not feeling something at the end of that film uh then you know you're not human (laughs) (laughs) it's if, if it doesn't get you to feel something uh then yeah then you know seek help no i shouldn't say that sorry um but yeah it, it will make you feel something no matter who you are like even oh, it will. the toughest tough guys will, will be crying i'm sure but um <laughs> great oh, yeah. choice fantastic and thank you for you know your three films sarah and, and and you know giving some exposure to two older films that maybe a lot of people may not have seen um so really great to encourage people to go back and check out those older black and white films forget the fact it's black and white just watch the movie and experience it yeah, and of course, Dumb and Dumber, you know, enough said. You know, that's just, <laughs> we don't need to promote it or recommend it. Everyone knows it. Everyone loves it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just to sort of wrap up, you know, my movie story and all that, I like to ask a couple of big questions of people, um, usually the main one being uh, wh- where are movies going, you know, or what would you like to see happen or do you have any ideas on what might be a new direction for film? So, yeah, essentially just like the future of movies. Have you got any kind of? thoughts on that or I've got I've got thoughts on what I think might happen I've got mm-hmm. thoughts on what I want to happen and they're in cool. complete opposite directions awesome um Take yeah <laughs> so uh, and to be honest I hadn't really thought a lot about where I think films are going um I feel like the the whole AI um thing is going to push us in a certain direction that might not be the best way to go. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine today um, and he has some really interesting ideas about where AI and films are going to go. And, and I'm not going to steal his ideas, but uh, maybe, maybe you can chat to him <laughs> at All some right. point from one of these and he can tell you what he yeah. thinks. But so I think that that's, it's going to go in one direction. Where I want it to go is I would love to see a return. I mean, you've guessed that I have a love of old films. I'd love to see a return to quality, like to focus on quality Um, unique original films that are maybe a bit slower because the pace of film like many modern cookie cutter films these days Mm. you know the the shots are changing so quickly and I feel like it's affecting kids attention spans you know like even the tv yeah and I just I can't keep up it gives me a headache and (laughs) so I think I would 
like bringing it back down to scale a bit, I think that it would be lovely to just see a bit more of a focus on slowing things down, real focus on narrowing it down again to just real character driven, you yeah. know, things. That, and and also I I love going to the cinema and I would love for there to be maybe a resurgence in, you know, that mm. collaborative viewing experience. You know, I, I remember queuing around the side of the cinema to see The Lion King when I was, I don't know, <laughs> young. And, and it yeah. was like, everyone was going to see that. That was the film that everyone was going to see. And it was just this thing where everyone was doing one thing yeah. together, you it was know? like an event, yeah. 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 And so obviously the the you know, having Netflix and streaming services is brilliant and, you know, I wouldn't be without them now, but there, I feel like there is something a little bit lost with how accessible everything is these yeah. days and, and yeah. so cinema still has a place, but I would like to see it come back more. Mm. Um, yep. um, so, yeah, no real, no real like concrete ideas of where I think mm -hmm. film's going or where I'd yeah. like it to go, but they're my, they're my vague sort of sort no, of feeling. That's great. That's really good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think AI is, is 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 it's pretty scary. I think like this is the reason behind part of the reason behind the writers' strike and an actors' strike in Hollywood at the moment is that companies are using AI to to replace script writers, to replace you know, marketers and copywriters and, and people who would watch a film and summarize it or review it, they're just getting AI to do it, you know? So it's, yeah, it's, um, it's a big, uh, threat. I mean, there's obviously huge opportunities out of it, but it's a big threat as well. And it's, yeah, it's kind of like when social media took off about, you know, 12 or 13 years ago, it's like, wow, there's so many cool opportunities here, but then we know there's possible threats here and we didn't know what the threats were going to be, but now we do. We've seen the, yeah. <laughs> how it's changed everything. And I think AI is going to be that new thing that, sort of has great growth but also a lot of um problems too so yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know if it, everything goes to shit we'll just go back and watch the movies you know that's why they're there <laughs> absolutely <laughs> so they're you know they're the saving graces just watch a good movie and get get it get out to the movies yeah 100 percent. i agree yeah. with you there sarah yeah. so well um thanks sarah uh it's been great chatting with you and and hearing your thoughts on these films and three awesome films and all really you know profound memorable movies as well uh so yeah uh thank you for being on on my movie story and um it's been great chatting to you oh thank you for having me i've loved being on it's a, it was a great chat thanks brian yeah no worries all right take care you too bye